the mission of the church is to evangelize the world, is to present the gospel of Jesus Christ. The past two weeks, our nation, we've been so preoccupied with the politics and, you know, uh, who's going to be the president, who's going to be, who's going to control the Senate, all that, all that stuff. And that's all important within a certain limits because regardless of whether your party is in charge or not, they can't fix earth. They cannot fix uh, uh, the United States. The only person that can fix us is Jesus Christ, the hope of glory. Do you realize that? So that is the message that God has called the church to present throughout the world, the gospel of Jesus Christ. The world needs the gospel of Jesus Christ. They don't need another, another ideology, the gospel. So you support, you support Family Life, about 70 missionaries throughout the world that preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Some of them uh, do acts of compassion, but we only support ministries that even if they do acts of compassion, they also proclaim the gospel. God hasn't called us just to do social work. God has called us to do spiritual work, to proclaim the gospel. So important. You know, and there's places, you know, there's Christians in churches and Christians in Cuba, Cuba, communist Cuba. You would think they'll be depressed. But they have to, those churches that have been impacted by the gospel, they're growing, they're, they're happening. They have, you know, I, I, I suspect they probably have more joy in those churches than some of our churches in the United States, amen, because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So that's what we get to do by supporting our missionaries. This morning, one of, our, one of your premier missionaries is, come, is gonna come and share from his heart. Brother Nathan Afaro has been a dear friend of ours and one of our key missionaries at the church. He and his wife, Christine, whose parents are also missionaries. She grew up in the mission field. Her parents, Bob and Naomi Kayas, are missionaries to Nicaragua also. Uh, but this couple, Nathan and his wife, Christine, um, have been in Nicaragua for many years, pastoring a church, uh, a, a, a growing church. I've been there two, three years ago. I went down for several days and spoke at a pastor's conference in Managua. They have a tent uh, that seats maybe a thousand or so, and the tent is on top of a hill in the, in the city of Managua. And people from all over come to have church there. Uh, and, and, and growing, and this, this church has pioneered seven others. So it's really one church, eight campuses uh, throughout, throughout the area. They're ministering on TV and radio, doing tremendous work. And you have participated in that. And I love Brother Nathan because I, I love him because he is so real and transparent. It is what it is. Uh, he'll stand, and last night he shared, he said, I don't know why I picked me. God, God chose me. God chose me because I'm available. And I love that because God is not looking for ability. He's looking for availability. Amen. So this morning, I would like you, could you stand? Could you stand? And by the way, you look so awesome on colorful outfits and everything, even those of you wearing J.C. Penney clothes. Man, you, you are, you're looking, amen. We're celebrating the variety, the variety of culture and so forth, amen. But could you, uh, could you make welcome uh, all the way from Managua, Nicaragua, your missionary, could you make welcome, give them, give them a flag welcome, missionary Nathan Arfaro. Nathan, would you come? Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, Pastor. What an honor it is for me to be here. Uh, this is one of my favorite places to be. I love, the, I love your church. I love your pastors. Um, your pastors are not only colleagues of us in ministry. They are dear friends. And uh, we are so honored to be here. Um, Pastor Al and Rebecca, they, are, they love missionaries. They are friends of missionaries, and, uh, and you as a church uh, also love missionaries and missions, and I'm so grateful to be here today. I bring greetings from my wife, Christine, and my family. Talked to them this morning as they were getting ready uh, for service down there in Managua. Uh, she sends her love. She wishes she could be here. Talk to my girls as well. We have, uh, for those who don't know, we have uh, three girls a 15-year-old, a 13-year-old, an 8-year-old, and then we have a boy, a 4-year-old. So that's my tribe. And it's a fun house. 
uh, especially with that four-year-old, because, you know, for, for so long I was the only male in the house. And uh, now I have company. Uh, but everybody spoils him. So I said, hey, for all those years, why didn't you guys spoil me? <laughs> but uh, they love this church. They love to come here. Um, when, when we visit Flag, you all go all out uh, for us. Um, this is... Uh, the favorite place for my girls to come because your pastors and all of you just, you know, you, you spoil them. And uh, thank you. Thank you for your love for so many years uh, for us and our ministry in Nicaragua. And you all are a part of that. Everything that God is doing in, in the country there through, through the influence that God's given us, you all are a part of that. And uh, today I will share a little bit about what God is doing there. Um, we're so grateful for, for your love and support. I was sharing um, uh, last night, told the, those that were here that, you know, during this pandemic, it's affected all of us. We are pastoring a church uh, in Managua. We started 10 years ago. We started with 10 people in the backyard of our home and has grown to a, a large congregation, uh, multi-campus congregation. And God has given us his favor. And, of course, we've had to deal with this this whole thing of, of the pandemic there as well. Um, we opened up back uh, for on-site services uh, a couple months ago, and we're about 60% back of our people. Not everybody's back yet. Some are, uh, are connected with us online. Uh, others, you know, I don't know. I don't know uh, if, if we've lost them. You know, we really need each other, and we need to stay connected with each other. Um, we, we were meant to live in community, in a body of believers. That's why there's such an emphasis of, 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 of being together and, 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 and being accountable one to another. But uh, uh, we're currently, uh, as Pastor mentioned, we're meeting under a tent. Uh, God has been so faithful to us. Uh, we're seeing his hand move mightily. You know, the pandemic will not slow down the church. Uh, absolutely not. Uh, God will triumph. We sang about that today. Uh, he will triumph, and he is God, and he will never be defeated. And if you're on God's side, you're, you're a winner. If you're on God's side, you're a conqueror. You're more than a conqueror. And the church is, is conquering around our world. Our theme this year is compelled. Compelled. Compelled by love. Compelled by the Spirit, compelled by the commitment that all must hear. That all must have an opportunity to accept Christ. And to have a life changed, to have a life transformed by the power of the Spirit. We see the life of Jesus because He is our, our example. He is our, our, our model. We see the life of Jesus that He was always compelled uh, to reach people. To, to touch people, to love people. Jesus always had people on his mind. Jesus always had people in his heart. Jesus always gave priority to people. Jesus always emphasized people. And, and he was compelled to, to reach the lost. And, and the early church took that model. And they did the same thing. Uh, missions and evangelism to the early church wasn't just part of church. It was church. It's, it was what they did. Um, they, they reached out to others. Uh, you know, as, as when, uh, one of the things I've noticed in, our, in, our, uh, in Nicaragua with our church, and I've seen it with other large churches, that many of our large churches before the pandemic in the Managua church, we were averaging maybe 1,400, 1,500 people uh, on Sunday. And, uh, and our satellite churches, they, they're average 150, 200, 250 people. And one of the things I've noticed that now that we've opened up our, our services is that uh, those smaller congregations, the 150, 250 people, they have pretty much got everybody back when they opened up again. But the bigger church, us in Managua, we're still at about 60%. And, and there's, there's a, there's a I, and I see this in other large churches. 
people are, are more likely to reconnect to, to, to that local body when, when, when they build relationships with others. And many times, and, and we see that, uh, we, we struggle with that in Managua. We want everyone to build relationships in our, in our church because if you just come and you just, if you just use uh, your time on Sundays to, to sit in a church a couple hours and you never connect with the church, you never connect with the vision of the church or with people in the church, you probably are not going to be there long term. And, and the early model did that. The early church. They were meeting in homes. It was just it, it winning others and, and focusing on people and not programs, not, not, not uh, buildings, but focusing on people. They did that because that was the example. That was the model Jesus gave them. If you've got your Bibles with you, if you go with me to Luke chapter 4, I'm going to read out of the ESV uh, version this morning. Luke chapter 4. In verse 18, 18 and 19, that, uh, that banner back there, compelled, has the, the scripture of Isaiah 61. Jesus quotes that in, in Luke chapter 4. Uh, that was a prophecy about Jesus. And I want you to see that it's not only about Jesus, but since he's given us his authority, his power to go out and minister in his name, that is also something that, that we do. And, and look, look at Luke chapter 4, verse 18. Jesus said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. And that same Spirit that was on the Lord is on us today. And he continues, he says, He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovering sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Amen. That was his mission in life. That was his mission here on earth. And that became the mission of the church. And he was compelled to reach the lost. As we are compelled to reach the lost. And I want to share with you three things that compelled Jesus in his life. We could, we could speak about many other things. But I want to share just three things with you. First of all. Jesus was compelled by the value of people. He was compelled by the value of people. People are so valuable to God. A soul is so valuable to God. In one occasion, Jesus said, you could win the entire world. You could gain the entire world, all the gold, all the, uh, all the silver, the diamonds, all the, all the riches of the entire world, and lose your soul. And you've gained nothing. The price of all the riches in the planet did not compare to the price of a soul. Romans 8, 32. The Apostle Paul said, He who did not spare his own son. Think about that. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for all of us. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? And then slide down to verse 38. Look at verse 38. Romans 8, 38. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor death, nor anything else in all creation. And everything except God is creation. Everything except God was created. Nothing in all creation will be able to separate you. Separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. The reason Jesus made an emphasis in the value of people is because he knew the heart of the Father. He knew the love of God for mankind. And that's why Paul says, you know, you have on, on, on one hand, you have, you have us. On the other hand, you have Jesus. Us, Jesus. Us, Jesus. And he did not spare his own son for us. God loves you. If you're visiting today and you're, and you're maybe not plugged into a church anywhere and, 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 and you doubt if God really loves you, I want to tell you, he loves you. You're so valuable to God. 
You are so valuable. Not because you're sitting here. You're so valuable because you're created in the, in the image of God. Jesus always knew the value of people. Every time he had these conversations with the Pharisees and every time they, they put more emphasis on their, on their law or the structure or tradition or works or anything else except the people, Jesus always rebuked them. In Luke 15, we have uh, where Jesus tells uh, three stories to illustrate the value of people. Uh, the Pharisees begin in that chapter, verses 1 through 3, they're, they're, they're criticizing Jesus because he sits and he eats with sinners. So Jesus tells them three stories, three parables. And uh, the first one is of a lost sheep, the second one is of a lost coin, and the third one is of a lost son. And at the end of each one of those, he says that whenever that which was lost is found, there's rejoicing. And he allows us to see beyond our natural eyes. And he tells us what goes on in heaven when a sinner comes to Christ. And he says there is, there is, there is a, a celebration in heaven when one sinner comes to Christ. There's more celebration for one sinner to come to Christ than 99 just people who do not need salvation. So, if across the street today, Someone gives their life to God. And this morning here, no one gives their life to God. <laughs> There's more joy in heaven. There is joy in heaven for what we did here today. But there's more joy for that one soul across the street. That's the value of people. Jesus always knew that. A few years ago, I had a lady come to our office there in, in Managua. She, we've been on radio for the last uh, 15 years. Faro del Espíritu. It's, uh, it's our, our program. and We've been on the radio and this lady came and she said, I just wanted to come and thank you. She had uh, been battling depression. And uh, she had three young uh, children. And she decided that day that she was going to take her own life. So she sent the kids to school. She locked herself in the house. She took uh, some pills in, in her hands, some poison pills that they used to, to poison rats and other animals. And so she took that and uh, she decided that you know, she had noise, uh, nosy neighbors that they may be wanting to, if, if the house was quiet, they might be figuring out what's going on. So she decided to turn on the radio. And keep the radio playing while, while she took these pills. She turned on the radio. And at that particular moment, I was on radio. And I was, she said, you were saying, if you have hit bottom, if you have lost all hope, remember how much God loves you. And he will reach to you. No matter where you're at. And he will rescue you from that. She said, I was listening and tears began to come down my face with the pills in my hand. And that day my life changed. Listen, God loves you. God loves people. And there are millions of people in our world in that same situation. Or maybe who think they're loving life. But don't know God. God wants to reach them. If we are going to be compelled as a church to continue to fulfill God's mission, we must be compelled by the value of people. Yes. Secondly, Jesus was compelled by eternity. He knew something that most of us would never know if he hadn't told us. He knew what happens after this life. The eternal son of God knew that eternity was a reality. He knew every one of us will face an imminent eternal destiny. And it could happen today. This year, this pandemic has taught us 
that life is so fragile. We've had to adapt to a new normal to try to preserve our lives because life is so fragile. When we die, that's just the beginning. That's not the end. Listen, folks. This, this life is so brief. When we die, that is just the beginning. The beginning of eternity. We are eternal beings. We're made in the image of God. God is eternal and he has put eternity in our hearts, says the Bible. We are eternal. We will last forever. You will last forever. I will last forever. It just matters where. The important thing is where. Whether with Christ or separated from him for eternity. And Jesus taught about this. He preached, he taught about eternity and about hell. I know it's not a popular subject. If, if, uh, if you don't like the subject of hell and you don't like to hear about hell and you don't want to know about hell, you have to eliminate about half of t- Jesus' teachings. Jesus always taught that there was something beyond this life. And it is now, while we are here in this life, we must decide if we will follow God and go through that path or that gate that is narrow, but that leads to life. Or that path and that gate that is wide and will let you do whatever you want to do. But the end is destruction. Jesus knew the reality of hell. And the reality of heaven. And he knew we will all face an imminent eternal destiny. His word will not pass away. His word will last forever. And you will as well. Choose life. Choose heaven. There's so many people in Nicaragua today. That through your giving and your praying. And all the other missionaries that you support around the world. They're preaching this because they have eternity in their minds. This January, every, every January in, in Nicaragua, we celebrate uh, our general council there, the Assemblies of God General Council in Nicaragua. So this, this January, I'm talking about 11 months ago, uh, I was sitting there at general council, and as a church... We, the, the very first offering we, we ever uh, took up when, when we started the church, the very first offering was a missions offering. And we've been supporting missionaries, Nicaraguan missionaries around our world for, uh, for the whole 10 years of our church. Um, and we support all of the missionaries, all of the Nicaraguan Assembly of God missionaries that are part of the missions department in Nicaragua. Our church supports them. Um, and... This January, we were supporting 19 missionaries. And uh, I'm sitting there at the general council about halfway through that big auditorium. And, and the missions department is, is, uh, is presenting to the general council six new missionaries. And so now there's not 19, there's, there's 25. And so I'm sitting there and, you know, we're in this process to to to. to want to start building we're in a building program and so we're trying to save and we're trying to put you know it's, it's so expensive to get this done it, our, our when everything's said and done this this thing will be anywhere between six to eight million dollars and uh and so I, i'm sitting there and in a split second i mean it was just that quick i thought well we are we're doing, we're doing good supporting 19 missionaries. And, uh, and these six guys, well, you know, they're just getting started. <laughs> they, can, they can wait a little bit. Mm. I'm confessing my sins. And, and I thought, well, I mean, all this in a second, you know, in one second. I said, well, these guys, well, down the road, we'll see what we can do to help them. But, uh, you know, right now, we got to take it easy. 
we're starting our building program here. And, and uh, you know, we're not going to drop any of the missionaries. We're going to continue to support the 19 missionaries we're supporting. But these, these other six, well, we're just going to take it easy and we're going to wait. In one second, I thought that. And immediately, the Spirit of the Lord convicted me. And said, oh, okay, Nathan, yeah, sure, sounds great. <laughs> Again, in a split second, you know. Sounds great, yeah. Hey, you want to take it easy? Sure, 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 sure. You know what? You got that building project? I'm going to take it easy on you as well. <laughs> so I said, God, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I've been in missions 25 years. I'm talking about something that happened 11 months ago. I've been pastoring for years in Nicaragua. I struggle with this as well. We all struggle with this. What am I talking about? We, we put our emphasis or our focus on other things and not the eternal. Yes, the building is important. Yes, it's necessary. Yes, we need to build it. But it's not eternal. It's going to stay here. Souls are eternal. And so I said, God, I'm so sorry. I, you're right. I can't get the focus off of eternity. So I grabbed the phone and I called our accountant at the office, the church, and I said, listen, we need to get ready. We're going to pick up six new missionaries. <laughs> And our accountant said, what, pastor? We don't have the money. God will provide. God will provide. You know, we can't afford not to, as a church, I'm talking about Casa de Mi Gloria, our church in Managua. We cannot afford not give to missions. That is, that is, that was what compelled Jesus. And that needs to compel us. Finally, the third thing. Jesus was compelled by the value of people. He was compelled by the eternal soul of the individual. But he was, always, but he, but he was also compelled by the potential of a transformed life. A person that was transformed by God had a tremendous potential. And he saw that. He saw people who were lost in sin, without God, with no hope. Slaves to their, to their addiction. Imprisoned by their, by, 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 by their, their way of thinking. And Jesus could see that if they only turned their heart over to him. He could do great things through them. They would accomplish great things through Christ. See, without Christ, we're nothing. Without him, we can do nothing. But with Christ, we can do all things. With Christ, all is possible. So he would... He would see, uh, he would see, a, get this, he would see a tremendous evangelist, a tremendous evangelist who would win her entire town. And a woman who had had five husbands and was living with a sixth man. If she only believed, and he told her, if you knew who I was, if you only knew who I was, and if you knew what I could give you. She changed that town. She saw, uh, Jesus saw in, in Zacchaeus, a man who everybody else saw as, as an individual who just, cared for himself and was out for himself and if he could steal or if he could 
uh, uh, you know, trick you and paying more of your taxes, he'd do it. Self-centered, egotistical. And when he came up on that tree to look at Jesus, and Jesus saw him, Jesus saw an extremely generous man. Sometimes we miss that. But he tells us, I say, hey, let's go to your house. And they go to his house. And he, the man has a, a change of heart. And he says, I'm going to give half of what I owe, or what I own. Half of what I own. Now listen, if you only own 10 bucks, five bucks is not much. But if you own 10 million, and you're going to give half of that to the poor. Zacchaeus wasn't a poor man. He was a rich man. And he says, I'm going to give half of everything to the poor. And then if I've ever wronged anybody, I'm going to make things right. The only one who could see that, who could see purity in a, in a woman who would sell her body into prostitution. And was possessed by seven demons. He saw purity in her. You know. The only one that could see potential in you was, was Jesus. The only one who could see potential in me was Jesus. And I'm so thankful. Growing up in, in, in Mexico, uh, in extreme poverty, I was, I was a missionary kid. My mom was uh, independent. Pentecostal missionary to Mexico and the missions organization that sent her out um, you know could, could help in only what they could and at that time I remember we were mom was receiving a total between all the giving I mean everything was $50 a month and uh, my father left us when I was 8 years old Ran off after another woman and started a new life. Didn't want to have any contact with us. For God to see a preacher out of that little boy. I remember when the Lord called me to ministry. and I, He'd called me when I was nine and eight, nine years old. And then... Uh, I ran from that all my life. When I was 16, 17, the Lord again reminded me of that call. And I finally said, okay, God, I'm going I'm to do what you want. I'll, I'll, I'll do whatever you want me to do except two things. Let's, let's, let's get this clear from the beginning. I said, number one, I don't want to be a missionary. Because <laughs> I grew up in the mission field. I, I know the challenges. I said, I don't want to be a missionary. And number two, I don't want to be a pastor. Um, I'll do anything but that. And I thought we had a good understanding. <laughs> I, couldn't, I couldn't stand in front of people and speak. I couldn't do it. Why the Lord called me, I don't know. I am, I am the least qualified. I'm the least qualified. And I'm not just saying that. I really am. Uh, I struggle through my English and I never mastered my Spanish. <laughs> so I'm a mess. But I love God and I, I love to see people changed. Amen. One of the things about pastoring is precisely that. You see people when they come to God, when they've been a mess and they come to God and their, their heart is changed and then you see them grow. Grow in their faith. And you see them say yes to Jesus as calling. To continue to reach others. That's what you do. Through your giving. Through your praying. The church today needs to be compelled. Like Jesus was compelled. And the early church was compelled. And if we stay on focus. If we stay on. Guided by the spirit. Led by the spirit. We are not going to go astray, even in our modern times. Father, I thank you for your goodness. 
Thank you for your love. Thank you that you have a purpose for each of us. When you formed us in our mother's womb, you knew us. You knew our days. You knew our name. And you knew our purpose. I thank you for the tremendous influence this church has around the world through their missions program. I pray, God, that you will continue to to bless the flag family. Bless everyone as they continue to stay focused and be compelled, compelled by love, compelled by your spirit, compelled by the value of people, compelled by the reality of eternity, and compelled by what you can do in our world through us when you sent out those 12 and later those 70 and later the over 500 and the 120 in the upper room you knew the potential of someone who had experienced God and what they could do There's potential in this room. And you have a perfect plan for each one. Thank you for calling me to Nicaragua. And thank you for calling this church family to be part of the great harvest of souls in Central America. In Jesus' name, amen. This weekend is always special. It's an opportunity for us to reevaluate how God may want to use us in world missions, in the harvest throughout the world. I once heard someone say this, and I think it's a fascinating phrase, talking about those in the church. You, each of you, you are either a missionary or a mission field. Each and every one of you, you're either a missionary because God has called all of us to be missionaries. Go you into all the world, everybody, or be, be a mission field. Okay, so pastor, I'm a missionary, but I can't just get on an airplane, go to Managua, I, 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 you know. So let me tell you how the three ways that we all, whether you are a full-time career missionary or not, that we are missionaries. Number one, pray. Praying for our missionaries. Praying for those that are at the field. Praying for Brother Nathan. It's not easy. I know that pastoring in the United States during a pandemic, it's been challenging. It's more complicated in another country where things are different. He, he oversees several other pastors, just the weight of responsibility. So I know that Brother Nathan and his wife Christine would say, please pray, <laughs> pray. Secondly, give. Giving of our resources. And the third way is going. Well, this year we could not plan or pursue our missions trips that we were planning, but we, we, we schedule events so that you can go pay for your own way and go to help on a short-term missions trip. A few years ago, we sent a team. You, a team of some of you went to Managua to help for the Nathan, we sent a team to South Africa a few years ago. Some of you have participated in joining 
One of my missionaries, Dr. Larry Martin, and you went with him to Brazil last year, I think, and also to Ethiopia. And I love that because when you go, if you've never been outside this country for the purpose of missions, I'm not talking about outside this country just to go to Aruba, that's not the same. But for the purpose of missions, when you come back, you come back rewired. It, it does something, it does something. During this annual missions convention, it's an opportunity for us to pray about how we can do, number one, we do all the time pray, but the, the uh, number two, how can we participate in world missions? Many of you, hopefully most of you, when you walked in, you were given a faith promise card. If you did not receive one, would you raise your hand and I'm gonna have an usher, ushers give them to you. Keep your hands raised. We want to make sure each and every one of you have one. Someone, amen. Praise the Lord. Just keep your hands raised. They'll, they'll get to you. It's hard to see when you're wearing a mask. Am I the only one? When you wear a mask, it affects your hearing. It affects your visual. It's like I'm tripping over things. I'm thinking my eyes are not covered. It's just my mouth. Amen. Amen. Very back there. And make sure everyone got. Amen. Someone in the middle section, back row. And in the very back row, Brother Josue, one of my young adults, a couple. I want to make sure everyone has one. Let me tell you what this does. Now, so many of you, part of our church, you have been faithfully supporting our missions program, and, and, and you have given once a month. We encourage you once a month. Some of you, we have a couple that write, they write a check once a year. It makes it easier for them. But if it's once a month, we encourage you to bring it or the first Sunday of the month, which is our mission Sunday. That's a Sunday that we try to emphasize missions and also invite any missionaries that may be visiting to come and give you a five-minute missions window. Amen. Um, and you may say, Pastor Curtis, I'm already, I'm, I am already supporting. Then I'm, I'm going to ask you then, if you're supporting and you say, I want to renew the amount. Now, don't put your pens away. I'm going to give you, I want to wait 10 seconds. If, I want to let the Holy Spirit get to you. Some of you say, let me write something down before the Holy Spirit tells me, tells me something otherwise. Amen. But if, if, it's, if you decide to renew, just indicate that. What that does, it helps us, our leadership, uh, schedule, plan, budget, our, finance, our commitment to our missionaries this coming year. It helps us really uh, be stewards. This morning, in addition to Pastor Nathan, we have a, a brand new missionary that you're going to start supporting uh, next month. Brother Matt Powell, would you stand? This is one of your new missionaries. <laughs> Amen. Thank you. Amen. Uh, they're going first-time missionaries. So we support veterans and rookies. First-time missionaries to North Africa. They have two children. They're going <clears throat> three children. You got a new one. Wow, you need to update your picture. <laughs> a wife and three little children moving to North Africa. Uh, we're going to start supporting them. We're not going to let this pandemic stop us. I'm sharing that with you because God spoke to me many years ago, Brother Nathan. I think I've shared this with you. And God spoke to me and said, if you sow abroad, you will reap at home. If you sow abroad, you will reap at home. If you bless missionaries and mission projects that can't help you back. None of this. I was raised in the Northeast and we had the phrase, one hand watches the other. You know, I hope you help me. That doesn't work in the kingdom of God. Sometimes God has you help somebody that can't help you, but God will help you. If you sow abroad, you will reap at home. So that's something that we've done. We're blessed in our church. We're blessed. We support, you support about 70 missionaries. Man, I would like to increase that. I really would like to increase that. But that but we want to be good stewards of that. So in a moment, I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray 
that God will help you speak to you regarding the amount for you to make a pledge. And you can complete that. Now, there's two ways you could complete the paper version after I pray, or take your phone, take a picture of that, uh, of that what's it called, a QR? QR, look at my son. He helps me with, keep up with the new techie stuff. It's QR, yes, it, last night I did that, and people were taking pictures, and I, for, for a second I forgot. And I, thought, I told my wife, they were taking pictures of me. <laughs> I don't know, she said, no, 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 no a QR behind you, amen. So we'll do that, and then that will help us. But let's pray. Father, we pause at this moment of our adjusted missions convention. Lord, we pray that you may speak to us regarding an amount over and above. This is not a percentage of our tithe. Over and above our tithe, which already belongs to you. Lord, the tithe is something we should give this special offering for missions once a month is something we get to give lord we're blessed compared to the rest of the world we're blessed and lord we want to partner with ministries like nathan's ministry and christine speak to us regarding an amount right now lord speak to us we've been talking about this for the past month reminded everyone last week lord now it's decision time In Jesus' name, amen. Would you take a moment right now and just complete your paper card or your QR, amen, and go ahead and do that. While you're doing that, let me just mention that earlier this year, um, you helped Brother Nathan uh, pastors a church. It's, it's, a, it's an incredible church. I loved it. If I was living in Managua, that's... The, God's me Gloria, man. They, I, they took care of me. I got to speak. It was a three-day pastors conference. How many pastors you had there? But 150 pastors from all over. They took care of me. And uh, now I, I, was, I was raised by my grandmother who only spoke Spanish, but my Spanish was not that strong. But after about a day and a half, it kicked in, right? I was, I was hey, listen, it kicked in. But the people were so sweet. They loved the Lord and doing such a great work. And they were underneath the tent. We we're in an air-conditioned building, you know? We get one mosquito, people complain, oh, we need to do something about the mosquitoes. They were on, on a mountain filled with people with mosquitoes and humidity. And this year, you helped do, up, do something. They had no water. So they had to transport water to the top of the tent church every Sunday, think about it, for everything. Several years ago, you helped build a, a separate structure for nur the nursery, nursery. This year, you gave an offering to help drill, they needed to drill for a water well. And they drilled about how many? Put your microphone. You all, a couple of months ago, a uh, pastor asked me to do a video to, uh, to promote that I'd be here. And, and he said, share about a need that you have. And we needed to really start that drilling that well. And so I mentioned that. And you all gave a generous offering to, to allow us to begin to, to get that well done. So we began, we began to drill. We drilled 670 feet. Wow. Because <laughs> uh, we're up on a, on a hill. And uh, so for the first time in nine years, we have... Uh, the water source right there, which is step one to get all our permits to build. And, uh, and you made that possible. Praise the Lord. So thank you. Water source. They still don't have water. They still need to do the plumbing. They, they don't flush. I mean, there's nothing there, but at least they started. Amen. We'll talk about it in the future about, you know, uh, this, there's other churches that were going to cooperate and to pick up other parts of the project. This year, they were not able to give because of, of, of COVID and whatever. But we're, we're, we'll talk. We'll, we'll talk. Amen. Because you know, we're blessed. Amen. But I, I want to share with you because a church is always preoccupied with themselves. Oh, we need new chairs. We need new things. That's, that's okay. But if, it's, if, it's, if you're ingrown, you're sick. And God doesn't want us to be a sick church. That's right. Amen. That's right. If you have uh, completed the card, 
I'm going to invite everyone to stand. Yeah, everyone, just, we're, we're going to close in prayer. I'm going to do something I did last night. In the past, what I've done, and we, we won't be able to do that this morning, I had all the missionaries stand here, and those of you that had completed cards, I would have you come to the front and give your cards face down to our missionaries, symbolic of your partnering with them. Well, we cannot do that this morning. But the Lord gave me, you know, and we were talking about this, as past pandemic pastors, God has given us creativity. So God gave me an idea last night, and it really worked. So what I'm going to do in closing, I'm going to have Brother Nathan, Pastor Nathan, pray for everyone here, especially those that have made a commitment. If you have made a commitment uh, um, on your way out, leave your cards, to give our cards to the, to the ushers. They have baskets. Just drop them in the basket face down. But while Nathan's praying for you, I want you to take your card and hold it up. If you did the phone thing, you weren't taking pictures of me. You were actually doing the QR, amen, and you complete that. Then I want you to hold the phone up, either the phone, if that's how you complete the, fo the form, or the card. And Pastor, uh, Brother Nathan, can you come? Can you pray for our entire church and for those to make up? If you have it, just go ahead, raise it right, right up, your phones or your cards, and we're going to pray for you, amen. Amen. Father, we thank you for your goodness to us. In our hands, we do not have a, a, a money uh, uh, issue. It is a seed. We are sowing in your kingdom. We are sowing in what compels you, Jesus, to reach the lost. And I pray for every individual who has made a faith promise. God, you will supply. And as you supply, they will be faithful to give. That seed that will bear much fruit, fruit of souls around our world. And I, and I thank you for that, God. And I bless every individual. Bless them, God, in Jesus' name. I thank you for the work that they're doing here in, in Katy to reach out around our world. And I pray that you will honor them. Your word says you honor those who honor you, God. And today, this morning, honor every individual. Uh, it doesn't matter the amount. They're doing it, they're, their part. And God, they're being led by you. And I pray that you will bless them tremendously and give us, give us, Lord, millions of lives millions of souls in your kingdom around our world in jesus name amen and amen amen god. praise the lord hallelujah amen god bless you love one another we'll see you in church wednesday night 7 p.m midweek boost amen